We're gonna move right on and I'm gonna pass the button to uh, Fang Fei, who will chair the, our last section and will hear the, the best paper award or the, like the, the presentation of the, the best paper um, along with another um, very interesting architecture attack. So Fang Fei, why don't you take it over and go ahead? Okay, okay. Um, so let's move to the uh, last session, uh, the architecture session. We have two papers. Uh, so uh, the first paper is severity code injection attacks against the encrypted uh, virtual machines. Uh, so uh, Matthias Morbiter will be the presenter. Um, so uh, Matthias, uh, you can get started. Yeah, now it looks good. Can you hear me? Perfect, no, nothing, no, nothing broke. That's good to hear. So, um, hi everyone, uh, I'm Matthias and today I will talk to you about some work I did together with Sergey, Martin, Marco and Eric, which we call in severity, which as you already said, is code injection attacks against encrypted virtual machines. Uh, this work is a uh, joint work between the Fraunhofer Isaac and the Te Technical University of Munich. So first, let's have a look at what AMD SCV actually is. Well, what you see here is the cloud. The way you usually work in the cloud is you rent yourself a virtual machine, and in this virtual machine you can install your own operating system and then do whatever you want, like process your data, store your data, whatever. Um, and this virtual machine will be managed by the hypervisor. And this hypervisor is usually managed by the cloud provider. The fact that the hypervisor manages the virtual machines means that a malicious hypervisor will be able to access the virtual machine and the virtual machine's memory, and thereby possibly extract confidential information from the virtual machine, or maybe even to modify the information. Are you going to say now, okay, I'm going to trust the cloud provider, so there's no need to worry about it. But what another attack vector is that somebody rent, also renting a virtual machine in the same cloud environment on the same hypervisor might find a possibility to outbreak it, the virtual machine sandbox, get control of the hypervisor, and then access your data. So to mitigate this threat, AMD introduced SCV, Secure Encrypted Virtualization. What this does is it encrypts the memory of the virtual machine and therefore preventing the hypervisor from accessing the data or the memory of the virtual machine. So let's have a quick look at the timeline of AMD SCV. So at some point SCV was introduced and as we quickly already said, it added memory integrity, uh, memory confidentiality to virtual machines. What we had afterwards is SCVS. Uh, ES stands for encrypted state. What this does is adi it additionally protected the registers of the virtual machine when the VM hands control back to the hypervisor to make sure that the hypervisor isn't able to sneak on the VM's registers. However, um, soon after those two got announced, we saw the first attacks on AMD SCV, which was a control flow modification attack. Afterwards, we saw another attack, which was memory extraction attack. And then we see, saw a code execution attack. So it was now also possible to execute code in VMs protected by AMD SCV. However, after the code execution attack, AMD announced some new CPUs, which then fixed the code which, which fixed the, which which fixed the code execution uh, presented previously. However, then we saw another code execution attack, which was, however, came along with some software patches, which then again so, so, uh, solved the code execution attack. So, what I want to present to you today now is a new code execution attack on AMD SCV which we coined severity. So how does severity work? 
Well, um, on the left hand side, we see the guest physical memory. So this the memory that is managed by the guest by the virtual machine. And on the right hand side, we see the host physical memory. So the memory managed by the host or by the hypervisor. To create the mapping between those two, we have the set, the SLED, the secondary level address translation, which is managed also by the hypervisor. So our attack consists of three steps. In the first step, we identify a trigger within the virtual machine's memory. A trigger is some is a piece of code that we are able to trigger from outside of the virtual machine. In the next step, we identify, we inject and identify a payload within the virtual machine's memory. And in the third step, what we do is we modify the sled so that the page of the trigger points to the page of the payload. And therefore, as soon as we trigger execution of the trigger, what actually gets executed by the virtual machine is our payload. And there we have our code execution. So let's have a quick look into how we perform these st steps exactly in detail. So to identify the trigger, we make use of NMIs or non-maskable interrupts. As soon as the hypervisor injects a non-maskable interrupt into the virtual machine, the VM will immediately stop doing what it's doing at the moment and jump to its NMI handler to process the NMI. So for us, that means that NMIs are a perfect trigger. To find the address of the NMI handler within the VM's kernel binary, within the VM's kernel, what we do is we analyze the kernel image of the, of the virtual machine. So we assume that the hypervisor is able to access this kernel image. So by analyzing that, we know at which offset of the of the binary of the kernel image, the NMI handler is located. However, we have another problem as attacker, which is KSLR, the kernel address space layered randomization. So this additionally randomizes the offset of the kernel binary within the virtual, within the virtual machine physical and virtual memory. So we also have to determine the KSLR offset. To do this, we discuss three different methods in our paper. One of that I will discuss now in a bit more details. So for the trigger identification, what we have is we know that somewhere in the guest physical memory there's the trigger. However, the problem is the memory is encrypted, so we don't know where this is located exactly. So what we do now is we make use of the fact that the we as the hypervisor are able to control the sled. Specifically, for each entry in the sled, we are also able to modify the flags of the respective entry. So among others, the sled entry, such a sled page table entry has different flags. We have the P flag, which is the present flag that indicates if a flag is present or currently swapped out in memory, then it would not be present. Another flag is the W flag, which means if the page is writable or not. And finally, we have the executable flag indicating if the page is executable or not. So in order to find the trigger, what we do is we remove the executable flag from all pages of the virtual machine in the sled. Therefore, as soon as the VM tries to execute any page, code from any page, the hypervisor will get alerted that the VM tried to execute paid, execute code from a non-executable page. And this alert will include information about which page it is. So what we're gonna do, we remove the executable flag from all of the page table entries, and then we're gonna trigger the execution of the trigger, which means that if that the trigger, uh, the execution will trap, in the sled and will alert us about the page the VM wanted to execute. And with this, we will be able to infer the location of the trigger within the virtual machine's memory. So this is the first step, the, execute, the, the detection of the trigger in the virtual machine's memory. The next step is the identification of the injection and identification of the payload within the virtual machine's memory. For this, 
let's first make a quick excursion into Word.io without SCV. So Word.io is the most common system uh, VMs and hypervisors use to exchange data. So how this works is we have the virtual machine on the left-hand side and the hypervisor on the right-hand side. So if the virtual device in the hypervisor receives has some data it wants to share with the driver in the virtual machine, let's say, for example, a network packet, what it will do, it will use, make use of Word.io. Within Word.io, we have uh, the Word queue structures. Such a Word queue structure consists of multiple structures itself. We have the available ring, we have the use string, the script the table, and some buffers. So when the virtual device now wants to send some data to the driver, in the first step, it will read the available ring, and the available ring will indicate which buffers are available. So the available ring has some index to the descriptor table, and from the descriptor table, the hypervisor can infer which buffers it can write to. So in the next step, it will write the information, so in our case, the network packet into the buffer. And finally, it will indicate in the use string that it has just used up the buffer and written information to it. So then this allows the driver in the virtual machine to read the U string and to determine from which buffer to read information from. So however, this is the setup without SCV. With SCV, we now face the problem that everything on the left-hand side, everything that's part of the virtual machine is encrypted, which means that the hypervisor is not able to access any of the word queue structure which poses a problem for the Word.io exchange we showed before. How SCV works around this issue is that it introduces an additional memory area, a shared memory area that is accessible for both the virtual machine and the hypervisor. And then it bounces the information from the shared memory to the VM. But first, let's have a look at the first few steps. Those are exactly the same as we've seen before. So the hypervisor will first read from the available ring, then write the information in the buffer, indicate in the use string that it has just written the information, and finally, the driver will read from the use string. And so now the driver will know, or the VM will know from which information to consume, from which buffer to consume the information. The difference now between what we've seen previously is that the VM will now bounce the information from the shared buffer to the packet buffer in its own encrypted private memory. And only then the driver will consume the information. So where we're gonna step in is the process of bouncing the information from the buffer in the shared memory to the packet buffer in the private memory. Specifically, Similar to before, we make use of the fact that we control the sled and therefore we're able to control the page table entries and the flags of the respective page table entries. So what we're going to do is we're going to remove the present flag from all buffers of in the shared memory page. So as soon as you put as the hypervisor adds some um, adds some network packets into these buffers, we will remove the present flag. This means that as soon as the VM tries to access, access the buffer and read from it, we will get alerted. And then we can conclude, okay, the VM has just read the buffer, read from the buffer. So the next step will be writing into the packet buffer. However, we don't know yet where the packet buffer is in the virtual machine's memory. So what we do is next, again, as the similar approach, this time we move the writable flag from all of the VM's pages. Meaning that as soon as the VM tries to write to any of its pages, we will get an alert. So after having read, the VM will now write the information into the packet buffer. And since it, the packet buffer is missing the writable flag, we will get the information about where the, write, the buffer is located. And this is the second step, the information, uh, the, the identification of the payload. For the last step, the remapping, um, let's have a quick look at how we do this. 
Uh, on the left hand side, we see the trigger page. So we have the trigger, the NMI handler, which is located at offset 700. And on the right hand side, we have the payload page. For this one, in our example here, we know, okay, when we inject our payload, it will be located at offset 600. So what we have to do first, when we inject our network packet, we add some arbitrary data so that the payload that we inject afterwards is located at also 700, so at exactly the same offset as the trigger. Which means that when we now do the remapping and remap the original trigger page to the payload page, as soon as the virtual machine fetches instruction from this offset, where it assumes the trigger to be, what it will actually do is it will fetch instructions from the payload and execute these instructions. And there we have our code execution. So again, going back, this is the overview of our attack. Three simple steps. Identification of the trigger, identification of the payload, and finally the remapping from the trigger to the payload. So going back to our timeline, we said the, this is like severity, the code execution attack. Um, the, however, the good news is that uh, AMD has recently announced SCV SMP, which stands for Secure Nested Paging. SMP provides additional integrity protection to VMs encrypted with SCV SMP. Yes, so ha let's have a look how this how this defense mechanism works. So SMP does not prevent us to ex to perform the first few steps of our attack, meaning that we would still be able to identify the trigger and the payload of our attack. However, what it would prevent is the third step, the remapping of the trigger to the payload page, and therefore it pre would prevent the whole attack. So in conclusion, uh, I showed to you severity, an attack which allows us to execute arbitrary code in VMs protected by either SCV or SCV ES. We, we achieved this goal by using page tracking and SLED remapping. Uh, we, have, we do have our, our proof of concept, which we also evaluate in our paper, which is based on Linux and Word.io. However, it is important to keep in mind that the general concept of our attack, the three steps, the payload identification, trigger identification, and the remap, also apply to any other guest operating system. So we don't necessarily rely on Linux. So we show that SCV and SCVS are vulnerable to various attacks. However, the good news is that SMP adds the integrity, also adds integrity protection. And the first hardware which supports SCV SMP has been recently uh, announced and available in Q1 2021. And there's all been the first software patches, this, which means that there is light at the end of the tunnel. And with that, I'm at the end of my talk, I'll be happy to discuss with you any questions. Thank you. Thanks, Matthias, for the uh, nice presentation. Uh, any questions from the audience? Uh, so actually, I, I'm curious, uh, what is the mechanism that uh, in uh, uh, SEV SMP that prevents the remapping attack? Um, so what they do is they introduce what they call a reverse mapping table. So you have uh, an additional table which pro this reverse mapping table provides additional information to the page tables which also say to which guest physical address and to which virtual machine a physical page is mapped so if we would do the remapping the hardware would be able to detect okay that now actually it is the page is still mapped to the same to the same virtual machine but to a different guest physical address and by that, it will be able to detect the remapping. OK, um, so does it incur additional performance overhead? Good question. Uh, as it's not available yet, I can tell you. I don't know. OK, I would, OK. Obviously, like, obviously, it has to. there has to be some performance overhead. 
but it's hard to say how much exactly. Okay. Uh, maybe one more question. Um, so, uh, uh, in your attack, uh, you use uh, NMI uh, as a handle as a trigger page. Uh, is there any particular reason you chose NMI uh, handler? Well, uh, we wanted some code that we know that is executed really as soon as we trigger. Um, there would, of course, we could also take something else, but this is just the advantage that we can stop the VM, then remove the executable flag from all of its pages, and check the NMI while the virtual machine is still stopped. And as soon as we will resume the virtual machine, it will directly jump to it again. So we don't have to use an NMI, but it just fulfills all the requirements we need. Okay. Okay, any uh, questions from the audience? Please feel free to post in the chat. Um, um, I have a question. Um, how did you figure out the, the offset of this NMI handler um, inside the page? Uh, for this, we assume that we have access to the kernel binary. So the, with KSLR, the offset of the kernel binary is randomized, but the offset within a page will stay the same. So we know that this will stay, the, uh, the offset of within the page will stay the same. What we only have to find is the page itself. Okay, sure, that makes sense, yeah. Thanks. Welcome. Okay, um, thank you so much for the uh, nice work, uh, very interesting work. Uh,